Julian Genta. Tanakwe, Mr. Speaker. Tanakwe. Tanakoto Etefare. Uh, the Green Party will be supporting this bill at first reading. Uh, like some of the other speakers have mentioned this evening already, um, notably the Honourable David Parker, we do wonder why it is that this bill has taken so long to come before the House, given that it's been five years since the, since the catastrophic event of the RENA um, hitting the Astrolabe Brief. And of course, there have been ongoing problems because of our inability to, um, to claim the amount of costs that uh, were actually incurred as a cause of that cargo ship running aground um, and disintegrating. This bill has three to four main points. And the first one is that, um, of course, it increases the amount that we are able to receive in compensation in the case that an oil tanker should have a catastrophic spill or accident. And that only makes sense. Um, again, I wonder why it's taken so long. This is the protocol of 2003 to the International Convention on the Establishment of an International Fund for Compensation for Oil Pollution Damage, 1992. So uh, presumably it's been about 13 years we've been waiting to exceed this particular protocol. And I'm not sure why it's taken quite so long because New Zealand is a country that trades on its clean, green reputation in the world. Part of the reason people come here, tourism being one of our major exports, um, is because we have these pristine beaches. And that reputation is at risk if there were to be an oil tanker, um, an oil spill, which then could potentially result in far costlier damage than what we're even, even able to access in terms of um, uh, a major oil spill. Under this legislation, we're increasing it from 377 million to 1.392 billion. That's um, uh, considering no no fault, um, but it, obviously it would cost us far more. And that much is clear from the national interest analysis, which goes into the ways in which um, a tanker spill in New Zealand may cause environmental and economic damage. And these include damage to New Zealand's aquaculture industry, fishing stocks, decreased demand for New Zealand seafood, and oil spill could also potentially impact shipping vessels reaching or leaving ports, resulting in delays and costs for exporters and importers. The environmental damage, if oil reaches our coastline, or the occurrence of an oil spill itself could damage New Zealand's tour tourism industry. So we are highly vulnerable to the impacts of a catastrophic oil spill. And even if the chances of one occurring are quite low, uh, the impact of the, con the, you know, the consequences of such an event would be so catastrophic that we should be taking it very seriously and making it a priority. And for that reason, of course, it's probably also uh, a very, very, very bad idea for the current government to be pursuing um, deep sea oil drilling as an economic development strategy because the risks of a catastrophic spill in that case are, um, equ are equally high. And the payoffs are actually quite low, particularly given we know that we can't afford to burn all of the fossil fuels that have currently we know are proven and exist, why we're exploring for new fossil fuel reserves when we know we can't afford to burn them, and the risk of a catastrophic oil spill. Um, could potentially be uh, enormous damage to New Zealand's reputation and economic um, ab ability to earn a living in the world. Um, it seems a bit short-sighted. The second part of this bill is, of course, um, the um, removal of limitation of liability on um, certain types of accidents relating to cargo ships and other types of ships, which is directly related to the RENA. And, of course, it's taken five years for this legislation to come to the House. Um, we're glad that it's finally come to the House, and we will be supporting it. Uh, but we do wonder what would have happened if, in the intervening years, there had been a similar um, ac accident. It would be quite costly for New Zealand and quite problematic. Uh, the third part of the bill, I do have some personal concerns about. Um, while it makes absolute sense to have drug and alcohol testing um, for people who are operating uh, marine vessels, um, there is a question about whether or not uh, a worker 
who submits a positive drug, drugs test if any level of alcohol or testable drugs showed up in their test sample, um, it would become problematic. I mean, obviously, most people in this house um, would enjoy um, a glass of wine or two when they have the ability to, and that's um, as long as it's responsible, that's okay if they're not on the job. So it's more about um, we're interesting, interested in drug testing for impairment rather than the presence of the drug. So um, I'll be interested at the select committee process to see if um, the regime that's set up for drug and alcohol testing is going to be appropriate for assessing impairment on the job rather than just the presence of alcohol or the drug. Um, the other changes that are proposed by this bill, um, so in the fourth section, are a whole range of technical changes. And one that jumps out for me is um, improving access to coastal shipping services uh, to non-mainland ports by allowing for foreign registered ships to carry freight to and from New Zealand's offshore islands and enabling territorial authorities to transfer responsibilities in relation to maritime activity to council-controlled organizations and port operators. Um, I am not yet convinced that this would be the right approach. Um, if anything, I think the events of this week have shown how important it is for the resilience of New Zealand's transport system to have a robust uh, domestic coastal shipping service. And I think that's something that this government has let languish in their terms since they came to power and they canceled the paltry amount of money that Ministry of Transport had assigned to it, which was one to two million dollars a year, for investigating the ability to increase coastal shipping. And of course, in that time, the freight ton kilometers carried by coastal shipping have actually declined from 15% to 14% of the total overall freight task. Um, at a time when we know we need to be reducing carbon pollution from transport, um, and knowing all that we do about the high cost of infrastructure, the high cost of transporting goods interregionally around New Zealand, um, we should be looking for opportunities to increase coastal shipping. We've got the ocean all around us. We're a coastal nation. Um, it's true that it didn't, um, it hasn't flourished in the previous decades, but that isn't to say that there aren't economic opportunities in moving more goods by sea. And by government examining the opportunities to increase coastal shipping services, um, they could potentially be vastly reducing the cost of moving goods around New Zealand, the pollution associated with moving goods around New Zealand, um, and the number of big heavy trucks on the road. But at the moment, our transport funding and um, assessment of infrastructure projects is uh, very, very siloed. So the government has a huge fund for putting money into a few state highway projects on the assumption that they're going to benefit people driving around New Zealand, whether they be in trucks or cars. The reality is that if we made it easier to move goods by sea, it could result in huge economic benefits in terms of reduced costs of wear and tear on the roads, of congestion, of costs to our um, domestic shippers, um, and a reduction in the safety, well, uh, an improvement um, in terms of safety risk. We want to make our roads safer, and moving more goods with big, heavy trucks is obviously not the way to make our roads safer, and it's certainly not going to reduce the cost of, well, there's, trucks have their place, Minister, trucks have their place, but there is the potential for more goods to be carried by sea or by rail, and if that's going to result in benefits to ratepayers and people using the road, then I think the government shouldn't be ideologically opposed to rail and sea freight, which they obviously are. So the Green Party would like to see a resilient and safe integrated transport system, and we recognize the enormous opportunities afforded by utilizing our blue highway, which is available to us if we can keep it safe, if we can keep it, and if we can protect our natural environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.